the gates to the deathless are open and that of course is a, is a great statement made by the Buddha after his enlightenment uh, uh, and so that gate is the is the mindfulness in the present moment at least that's what it is to me because uh, it couldn't be anything else. If you realize the power of this present moment, right now, uh, no matter how you're feeling or what your state of mind is, your physical being or whatever, is that uh, this is all there ever is. Uh, and so, you know, when we, we can conceive uh, gates to the deathless, some kind of, uh, imagine some kind of uh, pearly gates, maybe, or something uh, that we might might eventually find through years of uh, religious practice. But then, what are we doing? We're creating images and ideas, and and uh, it's, so the gates to the deathless remain something that uh, isn't present. It's uh, it's merely a an idea that we uh, can, that we actually create ourselves. Then ye soda one ta bamunjandu satang soda one ta is a listener, a hearer. So of course the, the teaching this sound of silence, this um, this uh, subtle cosmic primal sound of the universe, uh, as we began to recognize it and as they listen to it, kind of tune in so that you're, it's the background, the kind of, uh, that which is behind everything else. When people use it, sometimes, they, you know, we recognize how conditioned we are to conceive sound is in the ear. So one monk uh, said he, he couldn't use sound of silence because uh, he was such a heady person that, that he had to, um, 
it just brought him back to his head all the time. Uh, and so that's because the, of that perception of seeing it as something in your ears. But we have this, uh, we have this also recognize that as we expi- if we let go of that particular perception, we begin to uh, feel it or recognize it as a kind of resonating cosmic sound everywhere rather than just something going on in one's ears. So if you begin to uh, develop that awareness and the samadhi that comes through sound of silence, you begin to get a strong sense of the body in that silence. Uh, That's why I used to wonder uh, uh, when they talk about the um, seeing the whole body in the Satipatthana, the whole body perception. uh, You know, I couldn't really see how you could do that uh, in the way that I was practicing at that time because uh, in kind of the didn't you know I could get I could kind of follow sensations through the body but still it was it was like me trying to concentrate on my body from my head rather than uh, say from this transcendent awareness where the body is then seen as a as a whole thing rather than as just the the the, the parts of the body so in the perception of the mind is in the body or the body is in the mind these are ways of of uh, contemplating, the, say, the worldly. I was brought up to think of the the mind is in the head. My mind is my brain. And then uh, that's uh, the, the kind of attitude that, that I was uh, brought up to, to think it was, was uh, something inside me rather than, than the body in the mind. Now these are words, of course, when... Uh, we, when when we're developing this awareness and contemplating Dhamma, we're we're breaking out of just the rigid habits of thought and the conventional attitudes that we have from our cultural background. We're we're actually noticing things, contemplating. We can that's where paradox or even nonsense or doubt or non-thought uh, is is. Uh, we're recognizing rather than trying to make a, a kind of logical sense, uh, make it all fit into a pattern, that a logical pattern and common sense that we hold to within say, our, our cultural conditioning and education. When we, when we uh, use the Mantra, Puto, Puto, the Buddha's name, the, the knowing. So knowing is an interesting one, to know. Because uh, this experience that we're all sharing at this moment is, is the experience of consciousness. Each one of us is a conscious entity in this space. So consciousness is, is knowing. And they, Consciousness is is where you know when you're when the body's born, then it's a conscious form. So through this this particular point in the universe, this point right here, uh, then to know from this point the way it is. The conventional reality is is one way, isn't it? So we don't discard that or or uh, you know, refuse to to use conventional terms or conventional reality because it's the, the way most people think, the way the society operates. But if we're just stuck in the conventional realities as, as reality, then we are limited to that. I mean, we're not really seeing beyond it or transcending it. We're stuck in just the, the conditions that we acquire. 
our cultural conditioning, our personality view, uh, our emotional habits. We're, we're kind of stuck with whatever we got in, in that respect. And, and it's difficult to, to get any perspective on it. If, if, you re, if you're convinced reality is what you think and what you feel and, uh, and, and interpreting according to the conventional uh, attitudes that you've that have been instilled in, into you. So this awakened awareness, when we wake up, the the puto, the the knowing in this present moment, isn't isn't a isn't a cultural perception. Uh, it's not. It's not. You don't get it through education. It's not logical or reasonable. But it contains all of that, isn't it? To know is to be aware. And when we wake up and pay attention to life, then we, we see things as they really are. They use words uh, in uh, Pali such as tatada or uh, the datakada, or when they ref the Buddha referred to himself as datakada. Uh, so this is this tatada always has this sense of that which is present, here and now. So when the Buddha was enlightened, he didn't he no longer uh, regard himself as a personality with a history, with a with a past. Prince Siddhartha, son of King Suddhodana, and so forth. Uh, he no longer was a personality. Uh, but that which is present right now, so that's that's impersonal. Dattada, da is impersonal, but it's a statement about the present moment. That which is knowing now, awake now, isn't uh, a man or woman, a monk or a nun, a lay person. I mean, it's it's a pure state of knowing, and it's not it's not it's not European or Asian not Thai or Sri Lankan. It, it, it's, it's the knowing that is common to all of us. It's the knowing that, that, that we recognize when we're, when we're paying attention, when there is mindfulness. It's interesting living in the community, for example. There's, there's, uh, we, this, we now say the world's population was, um, will be probably, in the, by the end of this century, 10 billion or more. And there's almost, I think, nearly 6 billion at this time. And so we're very good at, at uh, reproducing our species, uh, and we we now can clone even. We can and we can extend people's lives, and, and so and we can. Uh, women at 60 years old can get, can get pregnant, <laughs> and so that we're doing kind of fantastic things in order to reproduce the species. <laughs> Uh, and uh, we've got uh, so many human beings that the idea, imagine at the time of the Buddha, the population of the planet was, uh, you know, not all that much. When I was born, that was 66 years ago, it was 2.2 billion. That was 1934. So <laughs> you can see it was up to almost 6 billion. Uh, within 66 years, but uh, that's uh, and, and the world has never, the planet has never had this many human beings living on it in one at one time as it has right now. So, 
it is a time that is, you know, has many unknown factors. What's going to happen? Uh, what, how are we going to provide the, the basic necessities, food and shelter and, and uh, human rights? How can, you, how can you afford to have human rights with, with such an enormous population? Um, and yet the movement is towards uh, democratic systems, human rights, and, and um, education, and, and uh, the mass production, the, the uh, material, materialism of the present age is, is uh, very tempting and fascinating to the human mind. Also, it's, it's interesting just to note how, uh, uh, you know, just in my lifetime, how many things have changed from, from government dominating the, the uh, British uh, Empire that, that uh, collapsed after the Second World War, and then uh, the rise of the United States as a kind of superpower, And I've seen the collapse of Soviet Union. I didn't see the rise of it, but the end of it. And uh, uh, I see the end of the British Empire. I might even the United States might even collapse before I die. It seems to it seems like these things that happen, you know, seem to go through the a process more rapidly than ever before. I mean, the Roman Empire lasted quite several hundred years. In China, they had dynasties that lasted like the Ming dynasty, I think it was 200 years. But the, what I'm getting at is that the, this changingness, the amount of human, human consciousness that exists on this planet, uh, moving toward, say, hopefully moving toward this awakened awareness, we can see what happens when the human mind just gets conditioned to be, uh, say, patriotic or nationalistic. And then we're quite uh, vicious and uh, narrow-minded and cruel to each other. Like, oh, racism or, or ethnic prejudices, genocide and class biases and all these uh, religious biases. Um, are, are from conditioning the mind, isn't it? identity, identifying with a particular group. And we can see, we, we can become very uh, convinced that our particular group is right and the, and, and the other is wrong. We can, we can believe it so much we'll die, we'll, we'll sacrifice our lives for what we, for our group, even though it might be totally wrong. Some of the causes, like these, these uh, human bombs, it makes you wonder about some people <laughs> will will sacrifice their life to blow up somebody in Tel Aviv or something by by uh, carrying a bomb on them and then blowing themselves up in the middle of a of the marketplace <coughs> because of. The conditioned mind is convincing, that convinced that they're doing a good thing, a kind of martyr for the cause, and yet it's involving self-destruction and violence towards others. So, in our practice, say in a in a Buddhist monastery, uh, people ask about the law of karma. Is this really? Uh, is this really true or false, or what do you think about karma? But to me, the, uh, the answer is quite simple, in the fact that you, you know, it's a, uh, if uh, you, you think a, a generous and kind thought, you, you begin to feel like that. If you begin to think in a, a hateful, negative way, you begin to, you begin to feel the result is, is that. Like metta practice, isn't it? Is a uh, is developing uh, a kind of positive attitude, a total acceptance, unconditioned acceptance of all beings. 
good or bad. So it's it's a, a metta is is an is an is an attitude of mind that embraces everything with a kind of patient, uncritical acceptance. So with metta practice, we we begin to to experience the joy of the totality of of being because we're no longer uh, when metta carried through to its, uh, you know, and, and with a measure of success, we feel a sense of oneness and, and patience and acceptance of everything. When we, when we, when we don't have metta, then we tend to become critical. We, when we're idealistic and uh, caught in, in the ideas of how things should be, then we, we, we can't accept this and that. We feel evil should be destroyed. Um, worms uh, shouldn't be in apples. There shouldn't be any mosquitoes. Uh, there shouldn't be any germs or poisonous snakes. Uh, there shouldn't be uh, any dirt or disease. And we, you know, we can create an ideal of what should be. But metta includes everything. It includes dirt, dirty people. It includes criminals and uh, very uh, moral people. Uh, it includes angels, demons, uh, Satan, God. Uh, it includes everything. Worms, mosquitoes. And so it's uh, it's it's the the way that we say an attitude towards all conditioned phenomena, which is non-critical. It's as simple as that. It's patient, accepting, non-critical. It's not stupid. It's not it's not uh, stupidity. Would be saying, I love worms when I don't, or uh, I criminals are good, or you know being ridiculous and not, and and uh, say just using a kind of uh, smarmy positivism, but metta isn't isn't uh, isn't saying you like or approve, but it's it's non-hating, non non-resistance toward the all, toward the conditioned realm. Applying that to to just yourself. Uh, you know, first you have to do it to yourself. I mean, even though sometimes it's, you know, it's easier to, to to feel metta for all sentient beings in some abstract idea of all sentient beings everywhere in the universe than toward the particular bad mood you're in in the present. So I mean, it's uh, uh, one can uh, th that which is immediate and impinges on us in the present, isn't it? The 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 nagging thoughts, the irritating uh, feelings, and the or the um, that which is is affecting us emotionally and physically at this present moment. It's more difficult to have metta for that than than the abstractions of all sentient beings. So bringing metta into the present moment toward the, toward the existing conditions is, is not, is, uh, is a challenge, isn't it? To, to be learning to be patient, in other words. Learning to, to embrace and accept the way you are feeling, the pain you're experiencing, the, the mood you're in, the, the 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 physical state you're f you're feeling at this time, and and that's that's quite that's quite difficult. Because the, the you know we tend to want to get rid of it, get rid of the pain, get away from the bad mood. It's interesting just to see how the uh, the Western mind, they in uh, 
to, like the defilements, the kilesas. And the, in, in, for example, they talk about in, in the books, this, the books about killing the kilesas, destroying the defilements. And, uh, but this to us is not particularly a useful concept. At least to me, I found it because it, it, it kind of feeds that desire to get rid of something, to resist something, which is a strong cultural pattern I have already. So, learning to, say, embrace my kilesas, different, isn't it? That always sounds kind of new agey and a bit uh, silly, but, but in terms of, of uh, of what I'm actually doing, that describes it best. Rather than, than resisting. Because the, the, uh, the, the habit pattern is to resist it, to deny, resist, push away, destroy what I don't want. So just noticing this, that, that, that this resistance, then, then uh, learning to even embrace that resistance means that the resistance is is accepted, and then it, then then I'm not I'm not resisting resistance, and then what happens? It it, it disappears, and then these these defilements, these kilesas, begin to drop away. They go away, they cease on their own. Uh, and the problem of trying to get rid of them then is no longer me, uh, tomato, trying to get rid of my defilement. Isn't it? it's, it's, it's through this awakened awareness and contemplation of things as they really are, beginning to recognize the power of this awakened state in which things are seen. All conditions are impermanent. They arise and cease, and in their cessation is peace. Upayas are skillful means in uh, Pali language. So sometimes we have to develop upayas that are appropriate to our particular needs. This is where knowing yourself, what kind of, where, you know, where your weak points are, where you, where you lose your mindfulness, where you're most vulnerable. Um, this, this is not to be self-critical, but to just once you you can see where where you where you're heedless or where you're most uh, vulnerable, then you can develop upaya again to to uh, use it for developing the path rather than seeing weakness as some kind of obstruction that's preventing you from getting enlightened. Seeing that, that the, the difficult things or the, the weaknesses or the blind spots or whatever you want to call them are challenges rather than when we see them as obstructions and difficulties and on, on the emotionally we can feel very, you know, kind of despair about ourselves. Because we we see ourselves from the level of the what's wrong with me and my weaknesses and and thinking in that way we I end up when I start doing that feeling a sense of despair and hopelessness. So changing that from that despair and hopelessness to seeing weaknesses, blind spots, uh, difficult things are 
uh, just you have to awaken to them, learn to you're learning from them. They they sharpen you up. So dukkha, then the first noble truth is is the thing that that awakens you. That see the dukkha of this realm is not something wrong or bad, but as it keeps you on your toes, wakes you up, and rather than seeing it as it's just a, uh, something that shouldn't exist, something you want to get rid of. Contemplating this this realm that we live in more and more, you you begin to see it is its basic nature is dukkha. That this relentless changingness uh, is, uh, is, you know, it means that, that there's nothing satisfactory that you can find. Nothing kind of permanently satisfying in this realm. I remember I used to resist this years ago because it seemed like a lot of things weren't dukkha. And, uh, and <laughs> when, you, when you look around, you. You thought maybe Buddhism was uh, on the pessimistic side, kind of, uh, you know, putting the world down. But it is pointing to, to the way conditioned phenomena is. Its very nature is change. And, and there's no, no refuge in it. There's no, uh, even though it has its beauty and its, and its bliss, and it's uh, and it's good. Oh, it's it, it's wonderful. It's, it's it can be wonderful and brilliant, and magnificent. Yet, it, to try to to hold on to any of it only leads to uh, disappointment and despair, because its very nature is change, birth and death, beginning and ending. So then, the what the Buddha is is asking is to wake up and in that very act of awakening is the connecting to the deathless. Just through the simple act of paying attention right now it's not not a high level of samadhi or or something difficult uh, that you that only very spiritually advanced people can do. It's so ordinary such a normal thing to do that we we don't regard it as being anything that important. But it's this ordinariness uh, that that we're beginning to recognize. Just the just the awakened moment here and now. And to really fully appreciate that, we surrender to the present. We're not trying to find the here and now. Where is it? You know, am I here and now, or am I not here and now? And uh, how do you? How how can you awaken? And uh, wake me up. <laughs> and then we can we can write a book. Probably there's books been written on how to wake up in the process of awakening when it's just an imminent act in the present. Something so ordinary, so simple, so basic that it 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 goes unnoticed. We can always try to be get high spiritual attainments rather than 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 uh, appreciating just the simple act of awakenness. So it is humbling, isn't it? The spiritual life uh, meditation humbles us because we're not really doing anything uh, in worldly terms that is uh, any, in any ways uh, very interesting or miraculous or fantastic. And if I could, if I could fly up in the air right now, you know, kind of rise up off this seat and go up to the top of the temple and, 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 and radiate light through all the pores of my body, you don't be terribly impressed. (laughs) 
and I could become a famous person, you know, and you know, get, you know, Amravati, this gets around, Pe people will pour in, for the millions, just to see me do this, wonderful feat. And so, but it, I sit here, you know, like, for hours on this, on the cushion there, awakened awareness, nobody's impressed. Not worth looking at. <laughs> you don't even know. Maybe I'm. I'm totally. You know. You might think I'm just in a state of complete confusion and delusion. You wouldn't know whether I was awake or asleep, or with a pure awareness, or thinking all kinds of. Maybe I'm pl plotting one of these uh, mass suicides or something. Who would know what's going on in my mind, except me? So it's uh, the, 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 get the point of, of recognizing the, the simplicity and the naturalness of it. And so learning to, to recognize the beauty of just being awake, being present. Sounds simple enough, but but recognize the conditioning of the mind is complicated. You know, I'm a I have quite a complicated emotional uh, I have complicated emotional habits. I used to, and you know, I'm, I'm much more simple than I used to be. But when I first ordained, I was incredibly complicated. Uh, kind of person. Nothing could ever be just what it is. Everything was something else. And, and the mind just went on, you know, just kind of making incredible complexities out of everything that happened and everything that I came across. You know, experiences of life. You know, find little joy in life because I, even even the good side of my life became so complicated. And I remember being married. Uh, two complicated people married to each other. And we complicated each other. So my complexities complicated my wife and she complicated, gave me plenty of complications. <laughs> so it ended up as being just totally confused, complicated mess, like one of these these balls of string that just it gets so tangled up. There's no way of untying the knots, isn't it? Just uh, so so caught in, in in a mess of knots and tangles. Because uh, nobody said, wake up. They said, you should be something. Uh, and, w and so, you know, I, I had ideas of what my wife should be. And she had ideas of what, about what I should be. <laughs> and, we, and we had our parents all thought we should be this, like this or like that. And friends and, and so the, the whole thing was full of shoulds and shouldn'ts and, and, uh, Nothing was, was ever seen for what it is. It was, it was always that there was something wrong and it shouldn't be like this. And, and it should, there should be love. We should love each other. How do you do that? <laughs> and if you think about how do you love each other, then, you, then of course it becomes even more complicated because you're thinking about it. I mean, you think about something too much, then uh, you can't really love anything because, <laughs> because you're, you're, you're coming from thought rather than from the heart. And so you're, you're endlessly trying to uh, you create these, uh, these ideals of uh, a loving, perfect relationship, which it becomes increasingly complicated till it becomes a tangle. 
and then so painful and such a mess that the only thing is to do is to split, run away. Becoming a monk was, uh, I found very, you know, something that I really uh, appreciated because it gave me a chance to to stop just this doing the same things over and over again and just uh, reinforcing. I mean, everything I seemed to touch would become a mess. Uh, when I became a monk, then I I, I found out that uh, uh, because of the nature of the life the, the, and the the kind of power of this convention, it helped me to to stop just operating in the, in the same old way. And then the then the then the, then it was always wake up, Sumato, pay attention, be mindful rather than you should be like this and you shouldn't be like that you should <laughs> so this this awakened state uh, it's an it's a natural state so it's not not something that that I couldn't do but something that I uh, didn't really understand before When I look back over the years of my life, I realize that that the the more pleasant part of my life, my early childhood, was probably because I was awake, more awake then than I was later on. Because, like an innocent child, isn't so highly conditioned, isn't it? You don't, you aren't complicated yet. You aren't all that complicated. You're quite innocent, and so you see things as they are. You're more inclined to see things, the suchness of things, because you, you haven't all the this experience, these memories, these all these attitudes that complicate everything. And then you lose that innocence. It drops away, and you become corrupted. And the story of the Adam and Eve leaving the Garden of Eden, isn't it? It's like the, always, that's what it means to me, Adam and Eve and before, when they were innocent, they, like they were n naked, they were nude, they didn't, they weren't, they weren't aware, uh, 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 they didn't make any problem, they were, they were completely natural, at one with God or with nature. And then it changed, isn't it? They became self-conscious, the snake, the <laughs> temptation. And then suddenly they're thrown out of this beautiful garden of innocence. So then, that's what it's like, especially you know you, you, when you start. I remember you know, realizing how starting school, becoming uh, a kind of more aware of the complicated relationships in in uh, in uh, the institutions of my social background the schools the teachers the other children the, the and and all the uh attitudes and conventions that were began to affect me i lost that innocence and became jealous competitive and and uh self-seeking and so forth Then back to, in the, in the monastic life, I find that awakened awareness allows me to let, to stop doing that, this, this obsession with myself, this uh, selfishness, this self-egocentricity drops away, because it's, it, that is something that's a, a, a network of complications, the ego, the self-view is very complicated into this natural state of suchness, the dattada, as isness of the present. So it's very simple, very pure, very simple, the way it is.
And as we return to that, we recognize the, the, we begin to experience the joy and peace that come from, say, going home, our real home. That is, Lung Pho Cha named it one of his books, Our Real Home. It's really, rather than a, you know, it's like going home has that, that, that kind of meaning to it, and of, of being in a place you know and you're at completely at ease. You're no longer a foreigner, a wanderer out in the cold. You come home, you're safe, natural, and at ease, and at peace. So that real home is always here. Now, that's nothing to do with being in a place. But the, uh, p many people do describe their realization of Dhamma is like coming home. So we have this week to, and there's uh, special conditions for formal practice. encourage you all and then uh, <laughs> uh, next month is uh, in April we have the uh, ordinary monastic routine but that's fine too isn't it whatever it's not it's not uh, even when we start you know thinking of, thinking of it in terms of some perception, then we all have our own views about it. But the, the, what's more, what's useful is just r rolling with the flow, taking taking it as it comes, rather than than creating uh, problems around the perceptions. Somebody asked me the other day whether I liked meetings or how do it, how did I. F feel about meetings and and I said well you know I think the real problem my, I suffer from the perception of meetings if somebody says let's have a meeting and I, I feel a resistance but actually meetings are part of it all too isn't it? And meetings and separations and and so forth you know, and you actually with the flow it, it's all right you know, some things are more pleasant than other things, but you're no you're no longer trying to just make life pleasant because you're interested in the flow of life rather than trying than than the ideal of of having the taking the very best you can get out of it. So, so it's the thing of of uh, like I said, an elders' council meeting. <laughs> the perception elders council meeting I have more that's the suffering more than the suffering than the actual experience of it sometimes <laughs> so anyway uh this evening there's no uh, midnight sit, so just carry on and have the puja in the morning, five, and, and uh, return to the noble silence uh, and uh, try to uh, use that more, just to, to uh, as a check on the tendency to, to uh, the, the the kind of longing to talk and the habits around speech. So here we have this these last few days as well as to, to keep this looking inward and and uh, to even observe that.
you know, how you feel this, this, uh, this kind of impulse to want to say something. <coughs> I noticed how I, I used to be someone that always had an opinion about something. Or like Americans, we, we oftentimes have our characters to always try to make jokes of things or wisecracks, things like that. So, so you have you, you have this tendency to want to 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 make facetious comments or wisecracks about things, and so I've watched these tendencies uh, to do that. And by watching myself, you know, I can see something. Somebody says something, and I feel this impulse to to make some facetious response, but I don't. I just watch the impulse and uh, I'm happy about that because the other, <laughs> the other must have been really irritating for you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I have to, do have to put up with such <laughs> behavior. <laughs> but it, it also gives you a sense of, of you. I am in charge of my speech. I'm not just this this push the button and, and you say this and then this, then I react like that. That's how it used to be, isn't it? It's a, these were just speech habits and patterns. So you, you say something and then the mind reacts. So it's, now the, the reaction is there, but then the refrain from, from speaking on it so that the tendencies toward that fade out and diminish. So you feel, one, one feels, I feel more a sense of, of uh, quiet composure and a, and a constancy that, that I never felt when I was just caught in, in just being reactive, kind of habitually reactive to uh, situations. So I offer this as a reflection for this evening.